going back about, well, it was about six weeks ago, my first Sunday back after my, my practice sabbatical, my, my miniature Sabbath, if you will. I started on a Sunday by preaching on the word renewal. And I just, I want to encourage you, that's not, that wasn't a, that was a standalone uh, piece of artwork on the screen, but that was not a standalone statement of what's being asked for each of us to find. These weeks are impossible for me to say enough about how desperate I find myself in these days for all of our sake. To take the whole counsel of every thing Jesus said and did and embed it into every corner of all of our lives. Some of you are here and your faith life has been tattered with abuses of power and authority and the weaknesses of frail men. Others in this room have found themselves hitting a, a moment of weakness and shame has befallen your life where you're, you're hesitant to pick up the cross of Jesus and follow. Others of you have found seasons of drought in your faith where things just move from Monday to Monday, never seeming to draw closer. I know. Some of you are looking for ways to be used and to grow, and all of those things are at our hands. But if you look across the landscape and you look at what our mornings are, you know that 90 minutes in a room together pales in comparison to 168 hours of walking step by step with the Spirit of God under the name of Jesus Christ. Together and independently, wherever we may go, the risen Lord Jesus is alive. He's no less alive right now than he was on the cross days before and even when he spoke the universe into existence. He is alive. And so this room and these gatherings are not our means of walking with Christ. They are a way to participate in the way. And the way is his. Not ours to define, not denominations to define, not cultural traditions to define, but the word of God according to the spirit of God alone. So whether you are young or you are old in your faith, whether you are experienced or eager to taste the fruits of the following after your Savior, wherever you find yourself this morning, the purpose over these recent weeks was to simply reacclimate ourselves with the grand, huge, incredible story that we have been given to both live in and tell. But now following last Sunday, we have something to consider, and that is the way forward. And so this morning, I want to look at the way forward then in what the first century church birthed itself into. And next Sunday, we're going to do the way forward for us. How do we look at them and look through them to the cross that they were still standing under to see our call right now, our moment, our opportunity, whether you are 113 years old or 13 weeks into this life, the Lord God reigns. And if he has called you, that means you have everything you need right now operating in your life to bring about the fullness of life of walking with Jesus every single day, following after him, bearing the fruit he is giving you in your life to be blessed in all things, but above that, to be a people of blessing. Are you ready to get to work, Church at Maine? Oh, that's not going to do. <laughs> I didn't come back a few weeks ago for that. I love you all. Yes, there will be a push in the recent days, but let me ask you just one more time. And if it's the same answer, that's fine. Maybe we adjourn and go on. But let me ask you one more time. Are you, are you ready? I'm going to start early. I'm being serious. Are you all ready to get to work? Yes. Then let's be found with him, starting now, as we look at the way forward for all of us together now.
These announcements that we gave at the beginning of the service are going to be brought up again during our gathering throughout each week. I need you to trust that if God has brought you here, then this is for you every step of the way, okay? I also have a note here that says I should try to end before 1 p.m. <laughs> and now we're ready. I want to ask you three, three, four questions to start, okay? The four questions are this. I know I just want you, you don't have to write these down. I'm going to ask them at the end as well. But I want to ask you sincerely. I want you to try and just answer this in your head as best you can. And please, I know some of you are well-versed. Please try to not give me your Sunday school Bible church answer that you might know would answer some sort of checkbox on a quiz. Please don't do that. Examine your heart and answer for yourself. Because I'm not going to quiz you. But I want you to think about what the answer to these four questions actually is in your heart. The first is, what is a Christian? Just ask yourself in your head, how might you answer, what is a Christian? What do you think a Christian is? Another question is, what is the church? What is the church? What is it? The third question, and again, these are all things I just want you to hold. The third question is, what is the kingdom of God? What is it? How would you answer that? What is a Christian? What is the church? What is the kingdom of God? What is a disciple? Those four questions. Just think about them. And I don't want you to feel like you need to get the right answer. The most important thing is that you know the answer you actually have. That's all. That's all, that's all I want you to carry. I'll ask those four questions again at the very conclusion of the message. And I also want to encourage you to maybe keep them in the back of your mind for a very long time. They are a helpful framework for the things that you trust in. Because sometimes the answers to these questions lead us to very overcautious, less ambiguous, more predictable, more controllable human ways. Sometimes the answers are downright willy-nilly, but of the Spirit. And how we learn those things are going to be very important for our flourishing in our daily lives throughout the week and our time together. So I asked you a moment ago, those four questions, are you ready to get to work? If you are, in fact, ready to get to work, then I want to invite you to open your scriptures to Acts chapter 1, and let's take a look at the way forward together. Starting in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, I'm going to skip through some verses. So for those of you who are following along at home, uh, I just want to give you a, a pre-up here uh, that Acts chapter 1, I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. And then I'm going to skip the rest of that chapter. Then I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, 12 through 24, 32 and 33. And finally, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. I'll finish with the end of chapter 2. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, in the first book, Luke writes this. He says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So very quickly here, I want to just leave verse 3 up there. Let's say hypothetically you were a handful of days removed from you yourself having raised from the dead. Be a fairly trippy event, wouldn't you say? At the same time, you would know that if I walk up to you and you've just risen from the dead, just for the moment, your agenda now is a little more important than mine, right? 
So the apostles and the disciples are all kind of around, and Jesus, their rabbi, their mentor, the person they've been following and watching and learning from and questioning and wrestling with and running away from, that guy all of a sudden presents himself to them alive after the suffering, and he has an agenda. Now, here in verse 3, I just want you, if you're a Bible highlighter, a circler, or a star, put stickers on it, whatever, do that to this verse. Because if you ever want to know like what's, what's kind of important, this is kind of important. Jesus' agenda after the resurrection, according to Luke, whose job is to tell everything that uh, the, the audience and Theophilus would, would need to know. And again, going back to Luke chapter 1 of his gospel, he says, so that you may have certainty about the things that you've been told, the certainty of the things you've heard. Luke's agenda is the certainty of the church. He wants church folks to be certain of the things that they've heard about Jesus. And he says, this is what Jesus found important during the 40 days. He was speaking to them about what? What they should wear to church? No. Whether or not they should care about what they wear to church? No. What about how often they should go or where they should go or what? What's, what's his agenda? The kingdom of God. Remember, I asked you a few minutes ago, what is the kingdom of God? That's going to be really important both this morning and every morning for a little while now. Because those answers are vital to your flourishing as a follower of Jesus. As a disciple, as a Christian, as a church member, those definitions are going to be important. Jesus' agenda is the kingdom of God. And we are going to examine that consistently and how your life and my life and together as a body of believers and in your place of work and in your home, the kingdom of God intends to interact with every part of your daily life. So he goes on, verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I don't know if you've noticed over here this morning, there's a hose that I almost tripped over a few minutes ago, and then Grant so quasi-politely, quietly walked over here and turned the water off. Everybody say hi to Grant this morning. Hi, Grant. Hi, Grant. Grant, do you want to wave or say back anywhere? You don't know where he is. He's still, he's still running around, running things. So Grant went to turn the water off because, Ethan, to be clear, the water is going to be cold, but we love you, all right? We're doing a baptism following our gathering this morning. We're also going to be doing some baptisms next Sunday and perhaps the Sunday after. I just want you to know that God has already been shaping some of these conversations. We found out this morning, somebody said it's now, and so we're responding to that. One of the people that's been shepherding him and caring for him in his life is going to be baptizing him this morning. We're going to do that at the conclusion of the service. Are you good to celebrate that this morning? <laughs> Shelby, are you good to celebrate that this morning? Shelby, his wife, is very good to celebrate this morning. So he finishes with verse 4. He says, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Going on to verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I want to just draw quick attention to this. I know that tomorrow's event for some of you has perhaps triggered some conversation on end times. And thanks to a lot of books being written over the last century, the end times narrative has exploded in a lot of dramatic ways in your life. But I always, when I'm with people and having conversations about end times narrative, there are scriptures that point to how we would distinguish and learn and interpret those types of things. But I want you to notice Jesus's tone when people start to figure out what to do when they think about the end times. What's his focus? It isn't for you to know the exact day this thing's tripping. But it is your job to do what you're told. And then he begins to do what he needs to do, which is to tell them what they need to be told. Everybody got that? So a lot of times we can get over fixated. Do you, do you think that's a risk for you that you can become over fixated on stuff? Raise your hands. Let's have church. So four of you. Great. All right. So everybody else has incomparable self-control. Praise God. I need your help. We'll meet after the service. For the rest of us who struggle with recognizing that sometimes our attention spans drift, this text helps us remember Jesus' focus. He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority, but you will receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And when they were gazing into heaven as he went, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, verse 11, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 12, and they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is an incredible moment in history because what just flipped is that all of them who were desperate to hear from Jesus, Jesus downloads on them kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. For 40 days, he envelops them with the final instructions on the kingdom living. Everything they are to live and to do, the apostles and the breadth of the people that remained. And he is teaching them in these final days. And then he ascends into heaven. To the right, and it, poof. And their response is important. They don't disperse as they once had, but they reconvene to a central place and they pray. For you and your life, I need you to start with this. As you individually today leave this place, it is important for you to not drift too far down the road of planning. Some of you type A folks, I know you, you've already got a list and or blanks on a sheet of paper ready to have said list once you get home so that you can find that list to linearly bring yourself to this conclusion. Let me help you. Line one, step one, part A, pray. And you really aren't going to come off of that until you come off of that. And you'll know when you know when you know. I was reading uh, a friend of mine, Victor John. He's overseas. Uh, he, he does a lot of work in um, actually all over Asia. But uh, one of the things he will tell you is in every context, in every place, everything that they do globally, there is one thing they mandate everyone be indoctrinated in, and that is a desperate desperate, devoted life of prayer. As a matter of fact, if you meet some of their leaders, you'll notice if they're wearing shorts, their knees actually look messed up. There's one guy named BJ. His, his knees actually look deformed. And when you ask him why, he's a little confused why you're asking why, because he's been working in the work for a very long time. Well, they look this way uh, from prayer. And you might think, oh, gosh, that's a little, little like intense. He's like, well, from, from, from 5 to 7 a.m. every day for the last, I don't know, 30 some years, I've, I start with him in prayer and just wait for him to tell me what to do that day. Two hours on his knees. And he walks funny. It hurts. But ask him if he would take any of that away and you would have to ask about the church plants that have changed and the disciples that have been made because those were all a part of how God chose to use him through prayer to bring about the change that God intended to bring about through him. If you go home today and your first inclination is to not pray, you've missed some of the very valuable points that God has brought you to. This last week when we learned about Eli and the possible changes that he was going to be enduring, whether or not he was even going to stay with us, reaching out to the elders and some of the staff, and we've had testimony of fact, but the first thing that we knew we had to desperately avail ourselves to was prayer. One of the members of my staff, actually her and her husband both had an extraordinary reckoning with God and a remembering of God's sovereign love in their life as a married couple, but not only that, the depth to which he desired to draw them to prayer. And the, the apostles didn't ga gather together to come up with a strategy. They gathered together to find out what do you want us to do. And they waited on the Lord. Has everybody got that? So if you have any other thing in your life that you're thinking about other than prayer, stop thinking about those things. And I know that some of you, you're like, yeah, but I, I, I always lose my interest. I'm like, okay, but that's where you are. That's where you start. And you just keep going back to that. All right, for those of you that are married, you know that if you have an uninteresting day with your spouse, you don't go find another one. You don't like change addresses and go get an apartment or whatever else because ah, we had a boring day together. Uh, I couldn't pay attention to them. We had a dinner conversation kept going all over the place like my prayer life and so I just left and ne never went back to them. Like that sounds ridiculous, right? So if, if in a healthy marriage, you know, you just keep coming back, you keep coming back, you keep coming back. Healthy friendships are the same. 
right? If you have a flat day at work, you don't just not show up the next day, whether it's yours or them, right? Why? Because there's an understanding between the two of you. There's an understanding between you and God. So availing yourself to prayer, desperate prayer, is line item number one. They did this, both in part because they didn't know of anything else they ought to do, but also because these were the instructions that God gave them to do. The kingdom of God does not come by clever schemes and well-built buildings with light and good songs. The kingdom of God comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit is delivered through the lives of those who have adorned themselves with the blood of Jesus. And that means they have picked up his cross and laid down their life. Has everybody got that? You said you're ready to get to work. I'm holding you to that. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived. For those of you who may not be familiar with this word, the day of Pentecost, the word means 50th. This was about the 50th day following the Passover. So Jesus was around for about 40 days. And then there was this 10-day window where we assumed they were just deadlocked in prayer in the upper room and wandering about the city in prayer, just hoping that God would somehow give them clarity on the next step. Because Jesus told them, you go to the city and you wait until you receive power and you'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and beyond. And so they go back and they do what they're told, they were to pray. So they were praying and they were waiting. What were they waiting for? They were together with all They were all together in one place, verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Fast forward down to verse 14. 12, I'm sorry. And they were amazed. They were amazed and they were perplexed, saying to one another, what does all of this mean? But others, verse 13, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. Peter, verse 14, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, And all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. I want you to think about this for a split second. The last time that Peter was in public around a a mixed audience, he was denying everything he might be known about Jesus. You guys remember that? For those of you who may not know the story, Jesus and Peter had an interesting conversation where Peter told him, I'll die for you. And Jesus was like, ah, you won't even live for me, really. Um, You're going to deny me three times when you're asked publicly. When you hear the rooster crow, three passes of your failure will have shown up in front of you. And Peter's like, ah, it'll never be me. A handful of hours later, it's him. Peter completely denies he knows Jesus because his life is on the line. He's got got this picture in front of the Roman people have already got Jesus basically bound. The cross is in view. His death is imminent. Here's Peter, who's getting ready to get lumped in with him. And so what does Peter do? He saves his skin. He says, I don't know that Jesus. What are you talking about? And three times he denies him. Fast forward 50 days from that day. Jesus is ascended to the Father. Peter's with this group of people, 120 or so, they're all in this room together praying. They just saw this unbelievable display of God's power, fire being a representation of God's presence. So God demonstrates his perfect presence with them. Jesus is ascended. Here comes the Father. I'm still here. God's still here. And some of you need to start living like God's still here. Some of you need to live like he's with you, he's available, and that's one of the things we learned the other night in prayer is that God isn't actually as far away as you feel that he is. He never has been. And the Holy Spirit in that moment evokes these people to faithfulness. And Peter stands in front of a mixed crowd knowing that the same group of people that said crucify him are now in this room looking at him and he stands up and he lifts his voice. What's changed? The Holy Spirit and the disciple of Jesus. The Holy Spirit living inside the disciple of Jesus. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. He is not backing down. Verse 15, these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Real quick, folks, this is all happening at nine o'clock in the morning. 
Can you imagine if you start your day in prayer and you begin to wrestle with the scriptures and you're just taking some time alone with God and you're listening and then God clearly in scripture shows you what it is you ought to do that day with a certain person or your job or your own individual life, a sin that you must discard or a relationship that you must walk away from or more closely with, whatever it is, but you know that God is clearly through his scripture speaking to you. Imagine by 9 a.m. you're rocking and rolling with it. Wouldn't you like to start the majority of your days this way? Oh, please say yes, church. So by 9 a.m., Peter's clocking, he's moving, and he has some very important things to say. This was uttered through the prophet Joel, verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. And the day of the Lord comes. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not everybody who gets their act together, not everybody that learns to stop doing this or that, but the people who call in desperation on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is God faithful? And is this his promise? So can anybody be saved? So what do you start your day with? What do we work forward toward? He goes on and he says, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Church, look at me. He's telling everybody, stop giving excuses. You've seen, some of you have this, you've seen God work in your life, but your little pet sin is so loving that you just want to hold on to it instead of discarding it as the very thing that's killing you. Instead of trusting this unbelievable work that God has already revealed to you in your life. You know, you've seen him. So stop going slow with your feet as if somehow you need another sign. He has revealed himself to you. He loves you. He has died for you. He has reconciled you to the Father. Live with him. Instead of playing with the passive things in your life and mind that look like the world. Because we know, and scripture teaches, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. We can't have two masters. When you have two masters, you have zero. Is Jesus really your king? For real. In your day, in your calendar, in your clock, in your to-do lists. Or is he somebody you visit in an hour of need? And let me be careful, let me, let me tell you this. I assure you that even if he is that to you, he's there. Not because of our concoction of an opportunity, but because of his steadfast love. He is there. And so should you, with shame, avoid turning back to him? Of course not. You should run to him. Every hour you remember to do so, you should run to him. And he is there. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. You can applaud that. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Verse 36. So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Everybody see that? Luke is recording Peter saying to the city of Jerusalem and all its inhabitants who could hear on that day, who are questioning this befuddering of the Holy Spirit's movement among them, giving them the ability to speak in the languages of those who were far off, who had come near for the Passover and the feasts. It is now 
the Feast of Weeks, the Harvest Festival, and it's now the celebration. And all these people have come in from all these other places and they're celebrating. And yes, 50 days ago, they saw the chaos that ensued on the Passover. And they've got questions and they've got stories and they've got confusion and their, their, their brother and their sister have their questions and confusion. And Peter stands up and with laser focus says, this is what it, this is, what it is. This Jesus, whom you crucified and killed, he is risen. Not only is he risen, he's at the right hand of the Father. And all this stuff that you've seen now, this is his promised Holy Spirit to all to all who believe that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Lord meaning the one to whom you are to trust and submit with all of your life and the Christ, the Messiah, the coming suffering servant Savior who in Genesis 3.15 was promised as the one who would finally stomp the head of Satan himself. That all evil and all death would succumb to his power, all authority on heaven and earth would belong to him, this Jesus, who we just saw in this story, raised from the dead, ascend to the Father, and give commands about the kingdom of God to the people of God. What do we spend our days getting excited about? Is tomorrow night's basketball game more important on your mind than whether or not you have the calendar appropriations to adjust your, your, your rhythms of life so that you can watch it? Or is availing yourself to the heartbeat of God for anything he might have you do, anything he might have you do, whether it's watering the flowers of a neighbor who's out of town, or emptying your bank account to rescue someone overseas, or to do anything at all that God might have you do to bless, encourage, build up love, and sacrifice for anybody in need around you, whether they have merit for it in any capacity or not, but because God himself told you to do it, will you do whatever he tells you to do. Church of Maine, as a group of people, will you do whatever he tells you to do? Verse 37, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Ethan, when I'm with people and I'm trying to figure out, like, does, does God have you? Does he really, like, have you? The thing I'm listening for when I'm with people and Aaron, I know you already know this, we've talked this through, but all I'm listening for is has, has his love for you cut you to the heart? Where you can't shake, he's real, he's come to you, and that, that there are things that you don't know and there's lots you don't understand, but you know that he's come to you. And you trust him and you believe him. You believe his love for you, you're cut to the heart. Ethan, are you cut to the heart this morning? Yeah. All right, well, you're gonna freeze in a few minutes but I've read that's better than burning somewhere, so I think that's a good thing, right? We're going to celebrate. <laughs> My point this morning for that is that every antenna that we have in our lives that is taking in information from every place around us, whether it's the barometer of the people and the relationships we have near us, and whether or not they're up or down or walking well or not, or the particular things that are happening in our own thought life, are our antennas more drawn to the voice of Jesus Christ? day by day, hour by hour, to remind you both of his love for you and the love living inside of you that is now available for those around you. Does your life belong to him? It says, now that they were cut to the heart, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, repent and be baptized. How many of you question whether or not you've done one but not the other? One of the things we're going to walk in over the coming weeks is the reality of what that word really unlocks for the life of a follower of Jesus. What is a daily turning to him? Any of you noticed how some mornings you wake up and you feel like you got to start back over at zero with him? Do you know that's actually okay because it ain't your measurement that matters, but his power in you that does? So if you're resetting at zero every day, it's God, you're going to be okay. So you may wish for a little bit better start the next day or a little bit closer feeling or experience. It's literally the creator of the universe. You're in his hands. Just rest. And then do whatever he says for you to do. And don't worry about how it looks to other people because they will have opinions. I don't know if you know this or not, but people have opinions. I read about it somewhere. It's fascinating. There's this thing called the Book of Faces. It's the replacement for MySpaces. And turns out that people's opinions just transfer from there to the next and the next. Now there's a Twitter. Who knows where things will go in the night? There's a TikTok and a this and that. And all it is is people with opinions. So fun. 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Is anybody too far away? Are the people at work with you who right now hate your God, are they too far away? Are the people in your family who are questioning whether or not you're nuts, are they too far away? Are the people in your past who you have wronged and are afraid to reach out to, are they, are they too far away? Are the people forthcoming in your life who are going to present challenges to you in many, many, many ways, are they too far away? And is the creator of the universe who spoke everything into existence, who rose from the dead, is he living in you? So just, just, just simple math, I graduated with 1.8, so this won't, this won't wear anybody out. Um, so if, then statements are sort of like helpful, right? If this is true, then, this, then I can trust this, right? So if God is living in you, and the people you are with are not too far away, what do you want to do tomorrow? I'm just, just asking the question, like if, if, if God is alive in you, and the people that you are with are not too far to be saved. What do you think about when you're alone? What do you think about when you're in your car? What do you want to do with this life? What do you want to do with the people around you? And some of you are like, Drew, but I've, I've prayed and things didn't get answered. The story's not done yet. How do you know what he's doing? Just because he hasn't shown you the fullness of his hand doesn't, ha- doesn't in any way mean that he hasn't shown you the power of his hand. And if he's shown you the power of his hand, then the work of his hand will come. You can trust him because he is faithful. He keeps his promises. And these promises are for you and all who are far off. Okay? Everybody can find him. The scriptures say that God desires that all would be saved. Do you think that's just a cute thing to throw on a fridge once in a while? It's the heartbeat of our Father. He loves the people. I was those people. I was too far off. I remember everything. We, we, I remember the picture, and I remember your faces when I showed you the picture of the place I used to live in Evansville. I said, I don't live there anymore, but I need you to know, had he not come to me, I'd still be living there. The address might have changed, but the nature of the person wouldn't have, but God came, and he rescued me, and he still is, and he's done the same for you, and so if his hand is able and it is, and he's living inside of you, I have to ask, what do you want to do with your time? With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation, a a generation marked by religious law, legalism, fundamentalism, and control and fear. Verse 41, so those who received his word, they were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you really want that? I mentioned a few minutes ago, I told Joe up here, Joe Graff, and he was a bass player. Hi, Joe. Everybody wave hi to Joe. Joe and Lori, um, they've been here uh, not quite a year, um, but they've been walking with God for a very long time. But Joe, Joe confessed to me, uh, one, of the cup, one of the first weeks that I came back from my time off, he came to me and he said, uh, and, and it was with tears, I don't, don't mind if, you know, if you mind I share, um, he was pretty emotional about it. So one of the things that he noticed while I was away is that I was gone for, you know, 40 days or so away, and he said, he saw among you all what he didn't realize he was desperately in need of for oh so many years. See, Joe and his wife, Lori, gave their lives to Jesus some time back, but 
really found some really obstinate experiences in different church settings. Anybody been through that? Where a particular church setup or culture or a moment just didn't foster health and, and tenderness and encouragement. And it's just the, the whole body of Christ part just, ah, or maybe leadership made decisions or people and just, and you got, your heart got hardened. Everybody? That was Joe, Lori. And, and since being here, they've appreciated uh, myself and Rashad and, and those have been good things. But he recognized that he was actually looking at me too much to determine his faith trajectory and what God had for him. And when I left for 40 days, it gave him permission to stop looking up here for the, for the teaching and the, and the whatever. And he started looking around here. And he started seeing that not only is God using us up here, sure, but the reality was so much more valuable for him to finally see how God was using you here. And that exploded his heart to the point that he realized God is with us. Not because of Drew and fancy preaching, although it is, but it is because of Jesus. No, but here's the point. God is with us, not me. God is with you all and me together, us. He is doing these things now. It is true. We don't place our confidence in our predictions. We place our confidence in the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will always move to lead people to repentance and an immersion of their life in all things that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit say. All things. That means we find ways to forgive fast. We find ways to pay for whatever fast. We find ways to love deeply fast. Why? Because that's what he did. Do you know how fast he came to me? He came so fast. And he did for you too. And so how fast do you think he might move for the people that have not yet found that he loves them? that he wants to forgive them, to restore them, to build them up and to redeem the whole of their lives. And our church family, our life together will be focused more intently on a life of genuinely pursuing the whole life of baptism. Not just the episode in the water, but the life of immersion that follows in obeying the life that Jesus has invited us to taste. Together and independently because there's no such thing as anything but those two. You're always going to be you among all the other you. And whoever those other you are, there's an opportunity. There's an availability that God has desired to place within you. Celebration Sunday is an opportunity for some of you to finally start to just relax around weird Christians. Huh? Let's be honest. Some of us are a little quirky. I mean, I know you're not looking at me that way, but others, right? Right? But seriously, people are, inti- some of you, so hang on, so I want to be, be sensitive to some things here, but set this up. Some of you, some of you have been harmed by over extroverted people who don't know when to stop talking and are a little oppressive in their behavior toward you. And that's not okay, that they've done those things to you. And so you're, you're a little sensitive to a church gathering because the reality is while you enjoy these spaces, you've met enough Christians that are so either full of themselves or full of something. But you're not eager to open yourself up to that. Tread lightly here. I want to invite you to pray. The whole thread through this morning, I'm asking you to pray that God would protect you that day. Pray. And please know that I and the elders will be praying as well. You are all protected from any of those unnecessary risks that can come from people who are, with good intentions or not, behaving poorly around others. Conversely, I want you to know, though, that God, with the extrovert and the introvert, intends to redeem both into one kind of... uh, What was Jesus, an introvert or an extrovert? Yes. (laughs) So if you're being conformed in the image of Jesus, there, there won't be an introverted camp in heaven that nobody talks about, right? because we can't, because, or an extroverted that's constantly on the march. Neither one. So I, I want you to know it is something that God intends to help you with. And those of you who are extroverted and have never figured out how to shut off the faucet that is your mouth, or your eager emotive behavior to jump into people's personal spaces far too quickly, pray that God gives you the wisdom to love others more than you love just being you. Because the scriptures say, Whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them because this is the law and the prophets. The whole counsel of the entire body of scripture points to that life. 
Look at the person in front of you. What are they wishing for? Operate accordingly. Everybody got that? Our Celebration Sunday is an opportunity for us to see in the eyes of one another the true birth of the Holy Spirit's love in all of our lives. Conversely, some of you have recognized that some people are a little difficult theologically to get along with. One of the unique things I've questioned, God, why am I still here? A prayer, a prayer I pray maybe more often than you're willing to, to trust, but either way, the theological diversity in this congregation is a little bizarre. Some of you have some extraordinary backgrounds in a plurality of denominational trainings. Some of you are former pastors in other churches. Some of you have led major ministry works throughout the globe. Some of you have been missionaries. And I find it very interesting that God has chosen to put us all in a room together to listen to a passing train and a balding pastor. <laughs> He's got a sense of, thanks. <clears throat> But let's push pause on the why for a second and acknowledge that he has. You are here. And that means that we have a purpose together. And that isn't for your pillar to raise up higher than the others or mine or anybody else's, but that the cross, that the cross of Jesus Christ is the single loudest and maybe only voice we ever actually hear. And that we learn from one another how to love well those he's placed in our midst. Now, some of you know that those theological conversations do in fact need to happen though which is why we have rooted. Because not only are theological conversations, but relational questions a necessary opportunity to be had. Some of you have really questioned, how do I even even think about my life with this church? Rooted is a necessary opportunity for you to just say yes, to figure out, what is God saying in the lives of others? What are they going through? How are they doing? How am I doing in their midst? What if the very best friend that I have yet to find is waiting in that space? Rooted will more cautiously than any other space help you figure those things out. If you've not been through Rooted, I am asking you to pray before your head hits a pillow today. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how many churches you've been to. I don't care how much you know. If you haven't been through Rooted, then you don't know. You don't. And the stories and testimonies that come out of Rooted are impossible to explain except for God's favor and his desire to draw people to him together. So April 18th, Thursday evenings, that's when they're meeting. Get on the app, get on the website, fill out the interest form. It's not signing you up to go, it's signing you up to learn whether or not you can go. But before your head hits the pillow tonight, I would love to hear that 75 people, 100 people, I don't care how many people, they'll figure out the logistics. They'll start five or six more. It's not my problem, that's theirs. But I'm asking you, and and here's the other thing. If you've been through it before, so do it again. Have you met everybody and drawn close to everybody in the congregation? No? All right, so you got a Thursday night free? Mark it. Make it available. Be with one another. And watch over the 10 to 12 weeks that that envelops that you will find the love of God in the peculiar lives and stories of the people that you've been with. You will find him speaking to you if you will listen for his voice. A lot of times we're trying to figure out how is he speaking to me so that they can hear him through me. And the answer is he may not. Mother Teresa's famous interview with Dan Rather, he asked her, when you pray, when you're seeking counsel from God, when you pray, what do you say to him? She replied, I'm a, I, I just listen. And Dan Rather kind of, you know, being a good journalist on the spot, kind of pivots and says, okay, well then what does, what does he say to you? He mostly listens. <laughs> if you want to play with that, go to Rooted. You'll, you, you, you'll see it. What did, you, what, did, what did you share at Rooted tonight? Nothing. Well, what did everybody else share? It was just, we just listened. And you'll know. Finally, there's this. When Joe and Lori Grafman were looking for a church family, the problem that they were struggling through was that Joe, and this was Joe's confession, so I can say it out loud. Joe admitted that he had never stopped reading the Bible. He'd read it through many times. He became well-versed in a lot of different theological arguments and pinnings. 
but he was missing the body of Christ. The love of the elbows and the kneecaps together, glorifying God with one voice. Are some people spiritually gifted in this and that? Yeah. Are some people that, yeah. Are some people, mm mm-hmm. What about the, yeah. But they're his. We are his. And so the way that we go forward from there is the way we think about what Jesus said. Does the good news of that kingdom, in Acts 2, 42 through 47, does the good news of that experience of human flourishing, does the good news of that kingdom, that God has come near and his kingdom is at hand, does that good news, does it bring Jesus Christ into the true operating center of your life? not as a peripheral voice to visit on occasion, but is he the true operating center? Is he the sending unit within you that decides whatever synapses are gonna fire, whatever decisions are gonna be made, whatever pursuits are gonna be loved, and whatever things are gonna be abstained, is he the true operating center of the inner life that you have? And I know most of you are gonna say, ah, it's here or it's here. Great, you have breath in your lungs and a cross to find, it's fine. Because of the love of God available in your life, you need not feel shame for the past nor fear of the future, but the same God that drew you will carry you. So the way forward is this. If you want to pray this with me, and then the the praise team will come up. Jesus instructed, when people don't know what words to fill the air with, when people don't have an idea, remember, what was his 40 days? What was his 40 days? What was his point? telling them about what? The kingdom of what? The kingdom of God. Not about how to do this or how to form a good church service or whether or not you should do three songs at the beginning. Where do you put the greet? Baptism is the thing. Is the water warm? Should you have a train or no train? Like, how do you figure those things out? You know, like people have asked me like, hey, Drew, if, if somebody won the lottery and paid off the church debt and, and whatever else, would you, would, you, would you sell the land and move somewhere? And my wife actually asked me like, if, you know, because the Powerball was like, I don't know, like a, a couple billion or something, whatever, it was a lot of money. And like, if somebody won that and paid off, would you, where would you move church at Maine? I'm like, is there anywhere where there are no trains? Because <laughs> I feel like my question, would, my answer would start somewhere there, somewhere that, where there's like, I would question like, how far does train noise travel? Can we just move like a half a mile outside of that? And so there's location. Anyway, but my point is this. The kingdom of God is in your life right now today. Not in our building, but in you. You see, when you leave this building, the magic of this space dies. I'm here during the week. I walk in here, it's a different vibe. The cleaning crew is in here Friday morning doing a great job cleaning up the space. Not the same spiritual fervor. Do you know why? He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so wherever you are, whatever you're doing together, the living God of the universe, the testifier of all that is good and true is living and working in you, for you, and through you for those around you. You are his. And so we pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is a disciple? What is the kingdom? What is the church? What is a Christian? Father, your kingdom come, your will be done, right here as it is in heaven. Amen.